It is 7 o'clock on Monday, the 2nd of October, and I'll call to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board. The first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. <coughs> Do we have a motion? Uh, yeah, I move to approve the agenda okay, as presented. Seconded. All right. Uh, I have one uh, piece of discussion. A neighbor of mine on Randall Street uh, contacted us late Friday asking if we could add an agenda, uh, agenda item on closing off Randall Street uh, during Halloween from 4 p.m. until 8.30 or so, thereabouts. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 41. Yeah. Uh, 4 p.m. See you later. Well, we'll know when to open it up. Um, <laughs> 4 p.m. till 5. After the candy runs so the <laughs> till, <laughs> 4 p.m. to 9. 9, yeah, okay. 4, 4, 4 p.m. to 9. nine. So All right. I'd like to add that to the, uh, if you're so uh, inclined, add that to the consent agenda. Oh, okay. Uh, friendly amendment, and I would include Elm, too. Yeah, the end of Elm from Ayers driveway onwards. To the end of uh, Randall Street. <coughs> have we approved that in the past? Yes. Apparently we have. Okay. We have. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought it just always happened. <laughs> okay. I'm getting old. Uh, all in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Now we're voting on the motion to approve the agenda as amended. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we have an approved agenda as amended. Consent agenda items. Uh, the minutes, the request for a uh, cater permit, and the newly added uh, closure of Randall and Elm Streets. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda as written <coughs> with the amendment. Thank you. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, consent agenda is also approved. Now we have the public session. Anyone that has anything uh, that they'd like to uh, discuss that's not on the warrant agenda, please come forward or raise your hand and we will recognize you. Please keep your comments less than three minutes if possible. Yeah. Alyssa. I have two things under the general public announcement category. One is I couldn't uh, pass up another opportunity <laughs> to plug the zoning update walking tour and open house this Thursday at five. Starting here, you can drop in even if you can't make the whole thing. Um, Planning Commission member was in here earlier. There's flyers over there. They're going to have boards, low key opportunity to talk about zoning. What more fun way is there to spend a Thursday? Yes. That's all on our website under news as well. And it's all on the homepage of the mm -hmm. municipal website under news, including a link to the flyer and a link to the fancy <coughs> story map where you can actually like, there's a really cool slider where you can do your property current zoning to propose zoning and mm. then move it back and yeah. forth. Wow. Oh yeah, it's a fun one. Um, <laughs> so check that out. Um, update number two is um, I was on the Waterbury Roundabout today and Lisa has, um, some update, she called it, uh, I'm gonna get the headline wrong because I couldn't find it, but like uh, potentially stormy news in local journalism. And just to say out loud, you know, Lisa, I think has done an incredible job providing local news coverage. Um, she broke down her finances for last year, which amounted to five to $6 per hour of her time, um, essentially recognizing that she does tons of you know unpaid time volunteering also get support from UVM and freelancers but it takes money to make things happen um, so she is having a conversation tomorrow Tuesday October 3rd from 6 30 to 8 about kind of like what is the future of the Waterbury roundabout and local journalism because they clearly don't have a fully viable business model at this point um, and so uh, that's going to be in the library? It is in, yes, Waterbury uh, Library's large meeting room, so I'm assuming SAL room. Um, come with questions, ideas, and suggestions. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to say, obviously, thanks to Lisa, as we've done before for all her mm -hmm. coverage, but certainly I'll be there um, and excited to think about things for the future. All right. Thank you, Alyssa. Anyone else? Anyone up here? 
Uh, Mike. Yeah. I just want to give you a brief update, if I can, on the uh, town fair. I know Alyssa went and Michelle Ryan uh, from the finance office went. I felt that for me it was a two days very well spent. Um, I really enjoyed it. But I'm just going to hit, hit some bullet points of some of the interesting ideas that I have uh, took away from, from, from the meeting. When I thought the idea of creating a community of distinction, I thought that was a really inter interesting idea. You know, don't just give it, you know, the recreation crossroads. Make your town um, a community of, of, of distinction. Uh, Dominic Cloud of the um, St. Albans City Manager uh, also had some pretty interesting things. He says he said to use use the power of public finance to do what the community envisions, and I think that's something that we do already. But I think that was to me it it uh, met home. And so if you want public support, you know you need to sell support for the project. Uh, you know, have an uh, economist on what you what what you want your local options funds for as we progress into potentially uh, doing a local options tax with our charter. Uh, strategic in engagement. I think we we use a lot of the things that they suggested to you do. Use a town plan, community surveys, which is some stuff that we have already done. Use the regional um, planning commission and use uh, different town pairs to uh, see what other like-minded communities have, have been doing. Uh, just if, if people don't know, Josh Hanford, who used to be the, who was the commissioner of housing, he's now, um, I think he's already at work for Vermont League of Cities and Towns, is at their intergovernmental review kind of person but he's kind of limited in as to what he can do because, you know, when you go from state government out to private sector, there's a certain cooling off period of being able to lobby. One year, is it? What's that? One year. I think it's. The I think period. it's either. I think it's a one year too. I, I, you know, someone said six months. I didn't. I, I, I didn't think it was six months. You'd probably know being an ex-state. I, I remember I was told to stay out of uh, politics for a year. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. They also talked a lot about uh, DEI. You know, I think you know, you know, they say how important it is to have welcome and engaging communities and seeking equity com uh, com committee members. You know, in, within your town. Uh, the ch I can't remember his last name. Doug, the chief recovery officer. Uh, he said. Uh, debris now is a, l a low effort, you know, it's kind of been done a lot. Uh, he's, they're now starting to be real concerned about river debris. I know driving up Route 4, it looks like Yucca Flats in some places, so a lot of rivers. Uh, I think the Winooski fared okay, you know, there's definitely some, some debris in, 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 in the river. Uh, he talked about this issue of cash flow with municipalities, and the, the shutdown's not, not, not applicable, so I won't even discuss that, because we've avoided the shutdown. Um, and he's, he talked about using abatement powers, if possible, with some folks, which we have already done. Mm -hmm. uh, talked about um, the Vermont Bond Bank, uh, Michael Gore. He discussed that there will be lots of money available to municipalities affected by the flood uh, to get money. Uh, they're also very concerned about losing housing units uh, versus building back uh, resilient. That's kind of a big focus that's going to be coming up. Um, out of all the disasters since 1990, this kind of says something, 37 of, of the 40 disasters were flood related, two were s uh, snow related, and one was the pandemic. So as you could see, as everyone can see, as we know very well here, that flooding is a very key thing. And he, he thought that it'd be useful to use social equity 
and green energy, uh, you know, would work for 90% in reimbursements, reimbursements with the things. Uh, another couple of things. Uh, they talked about paying attention to diversity issues. You know, all your, all your standards in recruiting uh, staff members in your town. Uh, you know, do have certain qualifications. Uh, don't always use uh, tech degrees or higher level degrees. Sometimes you could hire people who don't have a formalized degree, have very significant importance, would be really, really good. And there was a discussion of how you communicate is as important as what you say. Really, communication is a very vital thing. And it's not always the words, it's the method behind you know, what, what you, you contribute. And the public sector is uh, very different. We can't compete a lot of times with the private sector because the public sector is making good for society and you need to, to market that uh, what, you know, to people, especially if you're saying a lot of millennials like to be involved in things that are good for communities, et cetera. And uh, they talked about the great resignation. I've, I guess I haven't heard that term for a while. Oh, yeah. is, is, is a reality versus the great reevaluation. Uh, I think there's a lot of people looking at different careers now you know, in communities, at, especially after the pandemic. pandemic. Uh, he also said focus on events with strategic vision, visioning versus relying totally on planning, and that's something. And I, I, I like the way that they have, they talked about the, the chocolate milk of tears as being, um, you know, people who are against something, you have to sometimes look at <coughs> very different at different issues versus some people will look at what historically has been done and um, you know they'll, they'll find ways to, to do things and they also had a test it's the five why ask why five times it's a really kind of important way Mike in terms of next steps I'm thinking I'm already hearing maybe some things for next meeting agenda in terms of like follow-up um, yep. for DEI so maybe we just put that on the agenda yep and uh, there was just you know that, that's just a real very brief summary some of the real things that I took as highlights there are, there are a lot of things and I think you know maybe there are a couple of other things that I go into more depth at maybe another select board meeting I'm still kind of you know right. synthesizing what I heard here but right. I don't know if Alyssa do you have any further comments on the town fair no I wasn't able to attend all of both days but I agree I think in terms of quick actionable things DEI is something I'll propose when we get to next agenda um, next meeting agenda because there's some time sensitive deadlines mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and Mike, if you have other things that you do think uh, would be beneficial to discuss, uh, sure, you can let us know and we'll get it on the agenda. Also, Roger, I know I already said my plug for Lisa's conversation tomorrow from oh, six thirty to eight at the library, enough. but since she's, since she's here, I say since she's here in person, I just wanted to offer if she had any elaboration, especially because we have more folks online at least right now in terms of what to expect. Um, okay, thanks. not to put you on the spot, but if you want it, That's okay. Um, you know, I'm not really sure what to expect, to be honest. Um, I, if for those of you, I'm not sure, if I posted a column today on the roundabout site. It's under the business section, and it's kind of about the future and sort of the status of how the roundabout is doing in general. Um, and it talks about how um, we're doing well as far as people using our website and growing donors, you know, individuals sort of slowly, but that we're still really not at a sustainable level of operation three years plus into it and it basically sort of throws the question out to the community like um, you know do we want to do this do we want this to continue we need a new plan we need more people involved and I kind of you know throw this out there to see who's interested um, I've already had some people um, over the last couple weeks that I've been trying to sort of lining this up so I know we're gonna have some people there um, but I'd like to see where the conversation goes and what some ideas might be I don't I certainly don't claim to have all the answers 
Um, but I definitely need help, and it's, it's a way to sort of put this out there to people. Like, if this is something that you value, maybe we can get more people involved. Because um, I certainly don't want to have the situation that we remember from a few years ago, where all of a sudden the newspaper just stopped. Sure. <laughs> and, and didn't really sort of give any advance you know, notice or, or discussion, and so I'm trying to you know, be mm -hmm. proactive that way. And so, what's the time again? Um, it's going to be in the main uh, large meeting room in the library at 6.30 tomorrow night um, until the library closes at 8. So, okay. um, And if anybody wanted to read the piece, it's on the, it's on the website under business. So thank you, Elizabeth. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Any other public comments? Hearing none, let's move on to uh, the Community Resilience Waterbury. Yes, if you wouldn't <laughs> mind both coming up. Bill Shetland, Liz Schlegel. Do you need more at the table, though, or is this? I like to be on my spot. <laughs> Does that feel comfortable? <laughs> Familiar? <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Bill? I'm, Good evening. I'm Bill Shepelek, and this is Liz Schlegel, as you all well, no. Uh, Tessa Yip and Nora and Janet, I believe, are all part of CREW. And we're here to talk a little bit about that tonight, just to let you know uh, what we are, what we're doing, how we came about, <clears throat> and what our mission and goals are. So CREW means Community Resilience for the Greater Waterbury Area. And um, it was established or initiated or born, if you will, uh, right after the flooding of July 23, and uh, really the beginning part of August. Uh, Tom had talked to Revitalizing Waterbury to, to ask if they might consider being a fiscal agent for long-term recovery, similarly to what uh, the town did back in 2011 after Irene <clears throat> because um, we knew then and I think we know now that the town doesn't have really the capacity to do the things that uh, this organization is setting out to do. Um, Teresa Wood, who was uh, the chairperson of Rebuild Waterbury and was very instrumental in leading that group, uh, to raise over a million dollars and to rebuild uh, probably 130 homes uh, to the condition that they were in pre-flood, uh, uh, kind of convened a meeting with RW and invited a few people from the community who she thought might be interested and helpful to come to the meeting. And uh, we met. And uh, we currently have 11 members on the, on the committee. Um, we do have bylaws, uh, or almost have bylaws. They're, they're, um, they've been proofed and reproofed, and I think tomorrow night, I hope that we're able to <laughs> adopt them uh, officially, finally. Um, the bylaws will allow up to 16 members. We have 11 right now, and I think the 11 that we have are good cross-section of representatives. There are people certainly from Waterbury on the, on the committee, uh, but we have representatives from Moortown, uh, Duxbury, um, Middlesex, anybody from Middlesex yet? Nice. No. So um, CREW, as I said a minute ago, uh, community resilience for the greater Waterbury area. So we expect that we'll be assisting and working with Households that are located in Duxbury, Moortown, Middlesex, maybe Bolton, and and Waterbury, um, and uh, we are meeting weekly right now, every Tuesday evening at six o'clock at the uh, excuse me at the RW uh, conference room in the Steel Block down the street. Um, FEMA uses these long-term recovery organizations or groups uh, to help administer volunteer labor and to help uh, uh, 
figure out which grants are um, appropriate and how they can be funneled into the community to, to help. Um, we will be conducting some fundraising. Um, we have received about $28,000 so far. The, the major source of that first donation was... Community Foundation. Okay, the Vermont Community Foundation. And um, uh, we've had some uh, small other donations that have been made. We haven't really started to um, advertise or solicit donations yet. We felt that we really needed to uh, establish the organization, the bylaws, uh, uh, and uh, adopt a mission, uh, and and we have done that now. So um, the mission is to help residents and businesses in Greater Waterbury to build back smarter from the July 23rd, 23 flooding by providing technical assistance, resources, volunteer labor, and one-to-one -one support if necessary to affected flood um, to, to, to those who are uh, affected by the flood with a uh, commitment to equity and environmental justice. One of the things that we talked about, uh, and those of you who were here in 2011, and certainly Roger, who has lived through both 2011 and 2023 as a flood uh, victim, if you will. Um, uh, this flooding was certainly a little bit different than the last time around for Waterbury. Uh, fortunately so. Uh, we were much more like Montpelier and Barry the last time around. Um, we had over a, a hundred property owners who were impacted here, the vast majority of which suffered basement flooding. Uh, really less than a couple of handfuls of people that had more than basement flooding. Some businesses on Main Street, of course, had some flooding uh, as well as on Elm Street. And then I think there was some uh, above basement flooding <coughs> down on there too. So we're in a different, um, we're in a different uh, mode of recovery this time around. Uh, last time we were helping people, you know, put drywall back in, put flooring back in, um, all kinds of, uh, you know, carpentry, painting, uh, plumbing, all that kind of stuff was necessary. Um, fortunately, this time around, we don't have quite that same need to the degree that we had the last time. And there are certainly um, outliers who, who need uh, lots of help. But most people suffered basement flooding. And I think the, the talk around the last several meetings that we've had over the past couple of months is that, you know, it's only been 12 years since Irene. And how many years is it going to be before we have another one? Uh, we hope it's years. I mean, you know, I mean, it could be next week. We hope Maybe not. Week could be 500 but years. we um, we felt that what we needed to try to help people do this time was to do the the difficult things and the expensive things, but things that will really allow for greater resiliency in the future. Uh, one of the things we've spent a lot of time talking about is how can we help people move electrical boxes and panels, and is there a way that we can encourage uh, or facilitate even the moving of heating plants. Now, for some people, especially that last, um, that last element, heating is, is something that will be a long stretch. It's difficult to do. Uh, Right now, we're concentrating on tr just trying to help people get heat because it's already October. And even though it's uh, going to be 80 degrees for the next couple of days, we know that that won't last long. And people need heat. So we're not necessarily worried right now about moving people's heating plants. But 
we don't think that this committee, like Rebuild Waterbury, will end its service as quickly as Rebuild Waterbury did. Rebuild Waterbury was in place for, I don't know, 15, 18 months, perhaps. <clears throat> and when all the places were reconstructed, they closed down and they weren't heard from again until, uh, well, ever. But now here we are, and the commitment I think that we are making, the people on this committee, uh, is that this will be a long-term process where we will look to educate people, we will look to provide the technical assistance necessary, and to help uh, over time do the things that are just difficult to do, but that are uh, helpful. So with that, I think I will stop. Maybe you want to say a few words, Liz. There's a few other things on this cheat sheet that you gave me. But um, Liz has spent a lot of time. Liz has really been um, you know, a huge benefit to this committee. She has many, many contacts in the disaster world. She, uh, she is able to draw on her uh, professional job and the contacts that she's made there to uh, really provide lots of information and insight. And uh, I think we already owe Liz a, a debt of gratitude for the amount of time that she's put in. And um, anyway, so I, I, I'll turn it over to Liz and then allow you to ask any questions if you have any. Thanks, Bill. Thank you for the kind words. When I like see this room in my dreams forever. <laughs> and I think that's where it started, right? Knowing that it was going to take a lot, um, both to recover and get people ready for the next one. I was just looking at the FEMA numbers between um, 05676 and 77. It's 184 FEMA applications. We all know that getting denied by FEMA doesn't mean you didn't need help. I had a conversation um, with Vermont. Um, legal aid the other day, and they're like, it's definitely not clear to people that they are going to need to appeal and appeal and appeal again. You know, um, Janet and Tessa set up for us a FEMA, you know, kind of clinic here in the library before we knew FEMA would be located in Waterbury. Mike, you were one of the counselors for that. And it's so clear that we need to restart that, right? That there needs to be one-on-one -on -one buddy support for everybody who's affected, kind of regardless of what they need. Roger, I think it was you who said, we're all 12 years older than we were the last time. It's a lot harder to wrangle some of this stuff. And we, there are definitely folks who didn't get email then, you know, since then. So our goal is to have one-on-one -on -one support for everybody who wants it. Some of it might just be venting. Some of it, it will be helping people do their FEMA appeals. Some of will be helping people chase down contractors, right? We'll partner, we, Tom Drake is on um, this board, partnering very closely with the work that he's doing here so that he can say, oh, you need help putting together the Tetris of the money? We can help with that, right? The crew will be able to help you with that. So the idea is both to have folks who are willing to hold up their hands and say, I want to help, when we put out the initial call for volunteers, we asked people if they would be interested in helping with social emotional support or FEMA administration support. Fully half the people right, volunteered to do that. So we'll be reaching out to them in the next couple days to say, now we need you, mm -hmm. right? Like this is not what we need now. We, um, you know, in our last canvas um, that Tom and I worked on, we didn't get a ton of responses Right, we need to re-canvas so we can understand where people are. You know, the, the, for a lot of people, the efficiency of Vermont, you know, rebates, they won't be eligible or it won't match up with the equipment that they bought. Can we help close the gap for them, right, if they're still short of money? There are going to be a lot of little bits of money available, the Good Neighbor Fund, right, Nora represents the Good Neighbor Fund and works with Peter. Right, she's doing tons of one-on-one -on -one casework, but it's going to be helping people sew all those pieces together, right? They maybe can get a little money from their church, a little money from this fund, a little money from that fund, right? Contractors can give discounts. There's a lot of pieces, but someone has to help 
organize that because it's so overwhelming. So that's the general idea. And so we're also hoping, right, to have a whole bunch of people who build, locally build their own capacity to help other folk, right, when there's trouble. Right, I want us to be a community that gets good at dealing with trouble, that gets good at living next to the river. We don't appear to be moving, you know, neither does the river, right? And so um, we think it's gonna work really nicely in terms of some of the big community conversations that Water Bear will be having about community level resilience, right? What's the right thing for this municipality to do? even as we help people look at their own house. Right, I had a conversation with a woman a week or two ago. She's like, there's literally no one on my first floor. Nowhere on my first floor you could put an electrical circuit box. Challenge accepted, right? There is definitely going to be some carpenter or electrician who will be like, here's where we can put that. Right, because what people need is actually a little more tailored support than what they can get from Efficiency Vermont or what you know, they might be getting from their contractor because their contractor might not be thinking about the money side right. or where they can find the funds. Yeah, and, and we, we know when we realize that uh, even finding contractors is uh, a difficult thing. I mean, with what's, what the needs are in Barry, what the needs are in, Mon in Montpelier, um, and the needs are here. So uh, we will be thinking about ways uh, can we uh, contract with, can we crew contract with plumbers or electricians to do this work? Can we collaborate with the town to figure out maybe the, the town has better buying power than we do? Uh, we're not here to ask that tonight, but we're just letting you know these are things that have been talked about at our meetings and uh, you know, we're, we're just volunteers without lots of resources. Almost everybody has day jobs, and uh, um, <clears throat> I don't, and I'm glad for that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I find ways to be busy, and I've got an elderly mother that I'm taking care of, so it's, it, it's, it's a challenge for, for us as well. But I think we're all, we're all up for it, and we're up for it for the long run, um, it's not going to be like that. Uh, there is going to be uh, there the frustrations. We understand people um, have to be patient. Liz, or maybe it was Nora, showed us last week you know, a chart that maybe they got from FEMA talking about the psychological ebbs and flows that people have. and. You know, when everybody comes and helps them muck out, you know, they're feeling pretty good. Everybody's really happy. You're kind of my hero. And then everybody goes away, and nothing is really normal yet. And the psychological uh, uh, skids begin, and people get depressed. And some people get, get in a situation where, you know, they become immobilized. They don't know what to do or where to turn. And we're not by any means the only place that they can turn, but we hope that we are uh, able to fill the gap for some of those folks. One thing I mentioned last week, and I know you'll be uh, starting your budget considerations soon. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I know Mike, he talked about the VLCT town fair and talked about um, abatements. And I know you've had a couple of abatement requests. Um, in 2011, with Irene, the town and village together abated almost $100,000. I think it was $93,000 plus. And I, I don't think you're in that situation now. Maybe the town could think about putting in its budget not $93,000, but maybe twenty dollars or $25,000 in lieu of abating taxes and making a donation to an organization like ours or another one that might um, be able to use this money to do some of these things. And, you know, that was something I just threw out last week. We didn't vote on it, but I, I did tell the group that I would mention it when I'm here. And, um, you know, I don't pretend to know what your budget uh, needs are. 
you certainly have some flood related issues that you have to take care of so it's just something to think about it's it's not a demand by any stretch of the imagination so i think with that if you have questions liz and i can try to answer them otherwise we can get out of your way uh bill um we're uh you know recovering still uh, but pretty much recovered uh from the flood and uh we've decided to put in heat pumps and um i was wondering if that was something that was on your agenda as a uh, environmentally uh, yes. preferable solution i know the state of maine's got a big program to push heat pumps uh and i was just wondering if that's yeah i mean part of your agenda our goal one our first goal help 100 property 100 plus property owners and tenants with recovery rebuilding finding the help they need, choosing, choosing climate, uh, environmental, flood smart options. So yes, we're hoping that we would be able to, um, where appropriate, be able to help people figure out how to do that. Um, and uh, you know, I think we all know, those of us who live in the far end of the building, that old buildings built you know, prior to the uh, in the early 20th century or before, sometimes they're not easily retrofitted with heat pumps. But uh, yes, we're, we've had these conversations with Efficiency Vermont, uh, and we're trying to steer people to, um, to figure out how they can take advantage of uh, rebates or other types of um, financial assistance. And, you know, figuring out uh, and that's the technical assistance that we talked about, mm -hmm. trying to get somebody in to determine whether a heat pump is something that is appropriate in this building or not. So, so yes, we're hoping to do that. Mike. I have a question, and it's, it, I think it's a real important question because a lot of people, I think when we dodged a bullet, knock on wood, that you know, we, the damage wasn't as bad as it, it was, but especially people who don't have really big projects, it's, it's probably overly hard to get contractors for those kind of jobs. You know, the bigger jobs, you know, contractors are willing to do. I don't even just, in terms of getting a little something done before, before the floods in my, in my house to get a plumber to come in to do something was very difficult, and I know him, you know, but, he, but he's backed up. And just to get, right after my knee surgery, to get a banister put up was like pulling teeth. You know, everyone says, oh, we're so busy. And, you know, people who I know very closely, they just said, they're just so backed up. Really I don't know right. where the solution is, because it, it, there's a lot of people who need, maybe they don't need a full-time contractor, like a hand, they need, maybe more handyman types. I don't know what the solution is. And it just, I, I feel for the people who need work, but it's, it's gonna be really hard, especially because it's not just us. It's Montpelier, Barry, Johnson, et cetera. So the, the contractors in this whole area are just, they're, they're, at, their, they're at their wit's end. Yeah, we, we understand that quite, quite. Uh, yeah. So one of the key things we'll be having a construction committee, right, and we'll both be reaching out to folks to sit on that. Um, you know, LEAP has already agreed to put that out to its members and, you know, kind of see if people are interested in that. But one of the pieces about having the official designation from FEMA, right, right. which doesn't come with FEMA money, I want to be clear on that, right, but it does mean, I mean, we're on the map. It will be, this is who's serving this territory means that we have access to these volunteers, some of which are construction, are skilled construction folks. Right. And these are, these are groups that do this all over the country. And I sit on these calls, you know, on Thursdays for the Vermont VOAD, which is Volunteers Active in Disaster. And there are people saying, when can we come? We just need to know that there's a group to, to host us and assign the work. So that's, you know, there will, we hope, right, be, be folks who can do that, and then that there will be, you know, um, folks who are willing to um, maybe do some of that handyman as a volunteer, right, if we can provide the guidance and direction. 
Because right. I think there's, like I know from working with FEMA in, in, the, in past disasters, as to, I don't think them using like the small handyman contractors, kind of within their bailiwick, they want more licensed people and stuff like that, instead of someone who could, you know, do a little plumbing work, do a little, you know, electric, of course you have to be a licensed electrician, but. Plumbing too. Plumbing, plumbing too, <laughs> but, but a lot of people do rely upon, you know, you know, to get some basic stuff done, they rely upon people who are just skilled, mm -hmm. not licensed, and that's a, that's a problem. Uh, Liz or Bill, are you able to get uh, FEMA money for your volunteer work that you're doing? I know the town has been successful in getting volunteer reimbursement. Right. Well, not successful yet. We're <laughs> well, trying to be there, there's some successful noise in the background. <laughs> yeah. In terms of what we will get access to from FEMA, so the state has a um, has put in a request for disaster case management money, mm -hmm. right? And that will be awarded, and that will be awarded first to the state. The state will RFP and award a contract. Um, our hope, like that, you know, potentially would be capstone for the cap agencies, and they will be available to us as resources, and they will have access to the disaster fund money that the state holds, mm -hmm. right? And, and the Vermont Community Foundation money. So it is not money to do the, for us to do anything except we will be able to provide a conduit for access that people would not otherwise have access to because you have to have a case manager, right? According to the FEMA rules, right? To get access to what they call the last dollar. Right, the dollar the, of last resort. Was that the money that was just released today? There was money, additional monies released to Vermont today? No, it is still, and uh, there's okay. a, th this is, so that, there's a whole disaster case management, right. the, there's disaster CDBG, there's a whole bunch of different money different that layers. will come, right? There's disaster AmeriCorps folks that we will try to see if we can get one of, um, but, you know, so we'll, will benefit from that, but it's not, FEMA does not give recovery groups money. They give them access to money. Yeah. Other questions? Alyssa. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to both of you and echoing Bill's comments about Liz, just thinking about a group of you continuing to meet weekly. It's been a lot of weeks and that's a not insignificant time amount so thank you to you and thank you to the folks online as well who are doing this and being in it for the long haul and it really is adding a lot to the community so thank you um, my question would be what is the best way for us as a select board and a municipality to receive updates from you all and just stay in the loop about what you're doing um, is that just through the Tom being on the board and that type of overlap or would you envision some sort of regular schedule still figuring it out is a great answer too but just curious what your dream would be <laughs> well I think we can come anytime that you'd like us to come um, when things start to coalesce and things really start to to happen maybe we'll you know, there'll be press releases. Um, we, as I said, we haven't really begun soliciting donations yet, um, but we'll be happy to keep you in the loop any way that you ask. Um, you know, if you want us to come every quarter to a meeting, I'm sure somebody can make it, so. Are you gonna have a website or is there you know, minutes open? Or? They're talking about that, yes. We do, yeah. So we, I think somebody has the capability to do it. <laughs> I don't have a website yet, but uh, Tessa just uh, bought our domain today or Thanks. yesterday. So um, we're getting there, right? Kind of the, the um, FEMA's number one thing is they want the bylaws and they want the mm -hmm. MOU with RW. And I just want to put in a plug here RW has been amazing. We're so grateful. Like, we're so lucky to have this and so lucky that they have been, you know, uh, Krista Adams and Matt Larson have been alternating board meetings, like they're providing lots of support and resources. You know, Krista's housing background is particularly useful. And, you know, Matt's nonprofit background is amazing. So we're just so lucky that we have all these folks, you know, um, 
Mame and Bill were the only ones who were really doing this the last time around, right? And so lots of us are learning, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of doing this. But it is, um, I think it'll be a collaborative effort with all the nonprofits in the community, right? From the Legion, you know, to the Senior Center, to the Food Shelf, just for everybody to be yeah. able to say, this is what's happening, here's where we send people. And when the next pandemic comes, or the next thing, right, that we are able to mobilize people to take care of their neighbors, right, which is something I think that Waterbury has been really good at over the years, but it might be time to formalize it a little more, you know, so we keep exercising that. Thank you for taking this initiative. Mike? Will you be seeking 501c3 status or? Not right away. We have that I know that's through a RW. Mm -hmm. um, the bylaws uh, stipulate that you know we're not for profit. Talks right. about 501 right. C3, yeah. but uh, it's not a high priority yet. Um, all the donations will go to RW. Uh, for those of you who are watching who might be interested in sending some money, um, if you send a check, it's to Revitalizing Waterbury. Just put a note on the on the note line on your check that it's for crew. Um, they'll, uh, you know, be making sure receipts are sent and it's fully tax deductible. That's a, that's a good way because especially people who are looking at making larger donations, yeah. they do it for the goodness of their heart, but they also like the tax donation. Right. Yeah, Danny. Just really, thank you so much um, and all the way on the call. Um, and just for folks right now, in town who might still be looking for help or want to reach out after hearing this, are they still emailing Waterbury Health yes. for now? Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. All right. Unless there's any more questions, I want to thank you for everything you're doing and thanks for coming up and reporting sure. out. Sure. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You can have this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the mission was, I can email it to you. Mm, <laughs> you well, it makes it's parents probably it's easier. Had a lot of input. Next That's item on the agenda awesome. is road yeah. salt so use. Yeah. Tom, do you have? Uh, I know that you've attached something. <laughs> and if you wouldn't mind talking us through this. Sure, I spent some time with. Uh, Bill Woodruff and Celia Clark uh, trying to come up with a plan. Um, I've re also reached out to um, friends with Anuski and haven't gotten any good hard data yet about um, salt impact on the watershed locally. There's some information on the website and we're not, um, we're not one of their highest areas of concern. The data I do have is interesting in that um, our salt levels uh, it's for the summer period, the data I have, but our salt levels in the, in the river essentially go up with every storm, um, which just tells you the how mm -hmm. saturated throughout the, the river is throughout the summer. So I can only imagine that in March and April it's quite a bit worse. Um, we, we put our heads together and thought about the roads. Um, my push pretty hard to get some consideration for some roads in Waterbury Center. I thought um, there are some portions of roads that um, are flat enough um, and straight enough that we could have considered those areas. Um, Neiman Flats is an easy example, and Flats is in the name. Um, but but their their pushback was essentially forget about the post speed limits; those are really 45 mile or 50 mile roads for people. Um, so they thought it'd be um, it'd just be unsafe in the end. So the list we came up with is substantially in the old village, uh, probably entirely in the old village. Sunset. Um, Sunset Drive. Mm -hmm. I'll take no salt. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm only one house, but I'll take no salt. <laughs> so that might be the one exception, right? <laughs> yeah. Skip Keep my, your speed down. Skip my little. Um, and the Little River Road might be a great example because there's a brand new road that we just might never salt. Mm -hmm. um, we left out a few roads, um, just thinking about the traffic and especially the truck traffic. Um, but in essence, we're, we didn't get an exact number of the mileage of paved roads we have, but we're at 10, 12 percent of our paved roads. Price of salt this year is going from $82 a ton to 90. 
So any savings we get from this is, is completely offset by the price increase in salt. Um, and, and there's going to be consequences to this. If this is adopted, those roads, um, now the challenge they have is when it's really cold and the snow sticks to the road, they just can't clear it completely. So you wind up just driving on this hard packed snow for mm -hmm. some period of time. Mm -hmm. um, they're not super concerned about intersections. They feel like the, the main roads are salted heavily enough that, that the intersection sort of naturally, you know, it migrates yeah. um, onto the side roads a little bit. Um, and we'd spend a little bit more on sand naturally if we're not salting. Um, so this is not a cost savings measure. I think it's a measure that's a little <coughs> bit better for the environment. Um, but I don't, I don't profess to say there's a single nickel saved through this proposal. Okay. And um, um, the this item spent a lot of time in the parking lot and. If you wouldn't, if you remember, or uh, those of us that do remember, uh, did you just remind us <coughs> why this initiative came forward? Why are we moving forward with no salt policy? This came forward, um, my recollection is at the request of Chris Viennes. Yeah. Uh, who, has, who suggested to me at length that we both over salt and over sand. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I agree. Um, at the same time, I think these are lower speed limit roads, flat roads, um, and I think we're not impacting public safety by doing this. And there's no pride of authorship from, from our perspective. Um, if you wanted to, say, keep doing what you're doing and, and don't adopt a no-sell policy, I'm not going to argue against that. If you wanted to consider additional roads or subtract roads or say, hey, let's try this for a certain period of time, um, that's fine. Uh, we're, not, we're not arguing for or against this policy. Uh, we're 100% agnostic from a staff perspective. But also from an environmental standpoint, what you said <coughs> earlier indicates that the soil is saturated with salt, sure. which is probably not a good thing. Certainly not a good thing. Okay. okay. Um, I perked up when you brought up Neelan Flats and the speed limit because that is a constant complaint. <coughs> from residents of that road. Um, if, if the concern is that if we don't salt it, people will hit high speeds in a 40 mile per hour, you know, if, if they're hitting 45, 50 miles an hour on a 40 mile an hour road and it's not salted, they're gonna get in a car accident. But if they know it's not salted, maybe they'll actually drive the speed limit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have another point of view. I have kids on a bus and you know, there's no bus on Sunset Drive, there's no bus on Lakeview Terrace, but there's a bus on Neelan Pines. And I want my kids on that bus to be on a salted road. I want them on a safe road. Okay. So I, <clears throat> it's not about speeding for me. I have a whole nother Sure. Reason. <clears throat> well, it could be. <clears throat> it could be both, yes. And then okay. we did research a bit low salt policies and the observation, um, we did a little bit of research, made some calls, but the real observation is you'll find areas in Vermont where you drive and you see a low mm. salt sign, and it's a discretion of the operator. Mm. Um, so what may be low to one is not low to, not low to the other. Uh -huh. um, so we think if you want to control it, no salt is the, is the only real way to do that. And most of these roads that you've identified here are road either dead ends or short uh, sort of suburban type roads that people are going to have a tough time speeding on to begin with. Mike. I do <coughs> agree that if people know that the roads are not salted, they will slow down. I think that's a, it's, it's a behavioral thing. I think I'm not saying everyone, but there will be some people that I don't care what you do, they'll drive like a bat out of hell. But I think, I know when I see those, you know, I've seen them in the Adirondacks quite heavily. You see the no or reduced salt area. You, you make the effort to go a little slower. And I think that's where I think some people need to look at what, what their behavior is. You know, we have had people come before us wanting to have like 
Guptal Road going, going down to 25 hours, 25 miles per hour, which I know previous town manager and me agreed, uh -huh. it's, a, it's a public thoroughfare and what the speed limit is okay. So the problem is people are not going, you know, the 40 miles per hour, they're going 50 and 55 and 60 miles an hour. And, you know, maybe if there is an, kind of an ad, internal <coughs> advertising campaign that people to like slow down, there are kids out there, you know, the average person will get that message. Mm -hmm. There are some that won't. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to continue to rat out my son, but uh, he is a great example. Such a good example. Yeah, he's, you know, he's now 18, almost 19, and uh, learning it all, all the time. But he is one of those people that will pass by a no, no or low salt sign and not even see it. And I don't think you're going to be affecting his behavior with, with that sign. And, but it, you know, putting up signs may be another question. Is that something that you're considering? I don't, know. I don't know. Again, personally, I feel like this is a good way to start yeah. Owen Roads, where we're not worried uh, too much about speed, see what happens, and then maybe move to roads that are going to have more faster moving traffic. <coughs> Other comments, Danny? I'm curious how, um, if we chose the proposed roads and implemented this winter, what would be our method of collecting feedback or data to see success or not in terms of like? So it depends how we measure success. Is it, is it by doing this and not impacting public safety? Is it looking at uh, salt and Lamuski? Um, I'm hoping friends of Lubuski can can be a friend to us in that regard. In terms of public safety, there is there is presumably accident data we can access. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be surprised if there's not. I haven't looked into that personally. Do you have any idea if one year would make an environmental <coughs> it positive impact, or it would need to be a longer term? I think it'd be need, need to be a very yeah. long term issue. So perhaps the first year would more be like making sure there wasn't a negative public safety impact and then ongoing yeah. environmental study. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Alyssa. I appreciate the, um, how did you phrase it, agnostic staff perspective. I would say just personally, I certainly am taking the recommendation of the public works director and I'm a poor person at face value. So I have no notes on the roads. I guess my thought is, is this a pilot program? You know, I, I guess to say like, I had no strong inclination to <coughs> adopt such a policy, but recognize there may be merits. I guess my question along Danny's lines is like, do we try it for two months? And if we uh, hear quite a lot of feedback in two months, we revoke it. Do we set an amount of time we want it for? I do want to just say out loud that I appreciate it, that there is the note around if there's a storm that results in a significant layer of ice asking for discretion and certainly think that's a really important caveat to have to ultimately say we want town staff to do whatever they think is safe. Um, but let's say I'm not opposed to it. I am not particularly championing it. So my framing would be that we Try it, and in, in my view, if there is no impacts, then maybe we'd want to continue it. Could it be something that was in your, like, in your town manager report, maybe monthly for the winter, or even bi-monthly, and sure. just kind of keep us posted? Sure, absolutely. Lisa put it in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, not yet. Well, it's not the dotted well, yet. I know. Okay. <laughs> if, if, if we wind up going that way. Yeah. All right. And we have to make the paper viable tomorrow afternoon. Anyway, continue. Okay. <laughs> and uh, then she'll put it in the paper. Great. <laughs> after listening to what Alyssa has to say, I totally agree. I'm not, I, I, I share the same opinion of the town employees. We can either do this or not do this. And this all, to me, this almost feels like a waste of our time because unless we get data that salt is going down on the river it was all for nothing and we put <clears throat> we have created a potential public safety risk by not salting the roads in that inevitability well uh, yeah listen i say i don't think 
I think we're intentionally choosing to not create a public safety risk by using strategic recommendations right. for roads where there weren't safety concerns. So I just want to be clear. I think we're doing this because it is the desire to reduce salt usage without impacting public safety. Right. So that is a premise of my support of the policy. <laughs> sure. And Kate, in response to your question, it's a very defined scientific basis that salt does have an adverse right. effect on our rivers. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's a concern. You talk to any of the river river groups, they're they're getting more and more concerned about it. So I think it's to me it's worth trying and it would be nice to have some sort of benchmark as to how we could measure what the effects on our rivers are. Sure. Who would care to uh, present a motion on this? Uh, I'll move that um, we adopt the no salt policy as proposed um, on a trial basis for the <coughs> winter 23-24 season. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I just want to point out um, a couple of the streets. Wallace Avenue listed, I think, is actually Wallace Street. <coughs> if that's the one here in the village, just past Crossroads. They still live there. Um, and Healy Court is, I believe, H E A L Y. Just for, you know. You know, it's funny. Woody, I had that, and Woody changed the spelling. Really? Name, so. I mean, I don't know what maps there are there from there the past hundred hair. years that. That's. <coughs> um, so those are the only two that I noticed, but other than that. <laughs> and uh, is Randall being left out for any yes, good reason? Because there's drainage issues on Randall. Well, who didn't know that? But <laughs> 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 well, we had um, we had a bunch of complaints last winter around the speed bumps in particular. Oh yes, um, so I know who you're talking about. On purpose. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you certainly can edit. My own peril. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we'll just leave. We'll leave us up. We'll be both safe and salted. <laughs> that is another topic. That's <laughs> We're trying to deal with one thing at a time here. No, Roger recruits himself on that issue. We're putting a speed bump on the Middle River Road, and we've probably had 20 hours of staff time devoted to that speed bump. Oh, yeah. Wow. Design for, against. Okay, anyway, so we have a motion on the floor. It's been seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we have a no salt policy and the appointed roads for this winter. Next item on the agenda um, is the committee application process. Can draft it for us? Sure. So I just took a stab with the goal in mind of standardizing how community folks can apply to be a part of a commission, committee, or board. Um, right now, I think the process is simply sending Karen an email. Um, and they're coming in anywhere from, I want to be on the board, to like four page letters with six resumes. So the idea here, although I didn't stipulate um, length in the first uh, paragraph, it says, I think, um, a resume and a cover letter. And we can stipulate, I didn't say like one page, but we can do that. Um, just standardizing how the information is coming in so that when we're receiving it, we know it's going to be consistent. Um, and without overdoing it, it's very simple, basic information that shouldn't be a barrier to application. Um, and um, yeah, I think, and I think there's more to talk about in terms of the process of our decision making. But this was the, I think, lowest hanging fruit to kind of ease the process along a little bit. So happy to hear feedback. This is mostly just an amalgam of a whole bunch of different towns throughout Vermont and took what I felt was not um, not too big of an ask for folks and felt like good information for us to have. So mm -hmm. ready, open for feedback. Tom. Um, one, one question um, for the board overall is that would you intend to have um, individuals whose appointment lapses and are reapplying fill out this form? 
just something to think about. I took that into mind. Oh, maybe I took it off. Yeah, I just put how many years have you served. Um, so, yeah, I think it would be up to us how much we wanted, whether it's just this page and, and not the cover letter and resume again or what have you. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I don't know if we would need uh, a full application from somebody who has been serving, uh, but uh, we have to reappoint them, right? Um, right. And uh, I don't think it's a bad idea for them to fill out a short form, page long, to uh, if they want to run for another two years or whatever uh, their tenure is. And one other just small thing I'd suggest thinking about is um, you know, almost putting a check marks on this um, to let people know that all the select board policies that you adopt apply to those board members oh, too. Great. So they should just be aware that we've got ethics, conflict, and policies, those things. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> and there's a place on the website to find that. Yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question? Please do. You're suggesting that that um, application is, is necessary for reappointment, but not the resume and cover letter. Did I, I guess yeah, that's right. what I would recommend. Yeah. And Danny, I think what my book was great. The only thing I would add would be, and or a brief resume. Yeah, we could make it like a one page. Uh, we could say maximum two pages, because some people already have their resume. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. More than okay. two pages here. Okay. Well, we have seen sometimes four page resumes. Yeah. Well, some people are very yeah. accomplished. <laughs> I know. If I were an employer and I got a four-page resume, I'd throw it in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Depends what font. Can you wash <laughs> dishes? <laughs> it's in like font 15. Right. Like that statement okay. I can make those suggested right. changes so far, yeah. All right. Any other comments, Alyssa? Only other minor is one. Thank you, Danny, for making this. Um, I think personally, I'm most interested in a short cover letter detailing background experience and interest in the Border Commission. I think though we are incredibly fortunate to have really folks with really relevant experience. If you're really interested in attending a relevant boarding commission, to me that does really count for a lot. So I think we want to welcome that diversity of experiences. Personally, I would be okay with ditching mention of a resume because I personally hate updating my resume, but um, I guess if folks do already have them. I, yeah, so it's you know, an and or resume, yeah. but I can make it more clear that that would be optional. To me, I think a yeah. one, the consistency of a, of a, and I honestly think of this like we're calling it an application, but like a cover Info form yeah. <laughs> um, and then I would just say Karen I would defer to you in terms of you've been really good about giving us the terms and just figuring out what the best way I know you usually put them in the announcement right of like what it is so we could just just making sure folks know where to find that information so you're not having to field all those questions like right now this says name of commission and term and so I think that's straightforward from your posting but just would want to check with you because you get the yeah, emails. Yeah it brings up an interesting point because you know we have the once a year big Mm -hmm. push with this, but, but right now we have a vacant seat. You know, I don't even know off the top of my head what the term is, an uninspired term is. Um, so I guess when I list it as an open seat, they can you know, just put vacant seat. Or, yeah, yeah they, could I don't, they don't have to say the unexpired 1.5, <laughs> they can put open seat, like yeah. we're gonna. But I think I, if what you're asking me, Alyssa, is when you're reviewing them, so you know what seat they're interested in for those. I'm just bringing. I think, and again, we, I don't think we need to work it out real time. But I, I think we saying. just want a workable thing of right. Exactly. Like, and some of them have been easy. Like, I know we had one where it was like, "Do you want the one or the two? Or and people could say either. Um, but again, for those. Other we can things. also leave term out. But it's. I just think we are constantly asking. And we it, ask. So no, I agree. It. Putting it. And it's okay to not know. But what I will... But, uh, excuse me for a second. If you think back, Stacey Lambert, Lambert, I think is her name, she actually didn't want the full right. term, and that's what we gave her because we lost <laughs> track right. of everything. So we get so, to... Yeah, yeah. So okay, good a, point. There could be a real need for that to be there. Mm -hmm. fact, thankfully, she yep. accepted, but <laughs> that, was, that was a bit of a... When it says, a zoom. Waterbury resident, yes, no. Can we accept people, non-residents? No. I don't think so. No, but I don't. Why not? 
Yeah, I say one. This is a really interesting. I have heard very varying practices to different towns. I would say in practice in Waterbury, my experience had been that almost everyone is a Waterbury resident, right. and I think for maybe DRB or planning can just commission, which are quasi-judicial, it's statutorily required, right. but I have heard of other municipalities, can't believe, in particular smaller and more rural municipalities, we're having other folks. The other scenario I've heard is something like a homelessness task force, mm -hmm. where sometimes staffers from a relevant agency who don't, may not live in the town may be on a committee. I'm not saying we have to do that, but like I'm thinking of LEAP, which we mentioned, which right, is our right. energy committee. I know there is someone from Efficiency Vermont on that committee. I do not know offhand if they are a resident I, I, or I they're agree just that. Things like that, but I would say our regular kind of statutory boards and stuff like that, I'd be right. hesitant to. But yeah, I do. Again, so that's the only because I work in some smaller rural towns. I know there's some where like planning commission members don't live in the town, which I find wild. But I don't know is disallowable. I mean, and the other consideration here is that you know we've got Duxbury right across the river here, uh, which has very small governance Reasonable. structure um, and depends on Waterbury for its schools. Uh, well, I mean, we're together in a school district, but uh, the school itself is here, and a lot of other services are based here uh, and not over there. Um, and I was just talking with uh, Cindy Senning over the weekend, uh, and she was on the um, Restorative Justice Committee uh, here in Waterbury um, and served for several years. And, you know, I don't know whether that's a committee over which we have any particular jurisdiction, but, you know, I don't know why we would refuse her just because she happens to live in Duxbury. So. There's a solution to that problem. We just ask them to join Waterbury. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Cut out of the Legislative fund. <laughs> 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 Water okay, so I can take the suggestions and make some updates and then maybe send it your way, share with everybody and go from there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Thank Dan. Sure. Yeah, Dan. Great job, Dan. Thanks, Dan. All right, next item is the lo <coughs> local option tax policy. Tom sent out a memo. Resent a memo. Resent? Yeah, I was going to say. I was saying, like not that date. <laughs> yeah. And. Oh, I did have a question about this. Then uh, why don't you speak? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, why are we looking at this memo again? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, at. Uh, the select board meeting when we discussed it at some length. Um, I don't recall Tom Stevens saying this, but Teresa mentioned particularly that having an adopted policy would make it a little easier for her to shepherd this through the legislature. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that Stowe, um, Stowe's did, Stowe simply, um, I don't know if they formally adopted a policy, but their position simply was to use it to reduce property taxes. So some towns have extensive policies and some towns have um, essentially make the decision each year during their budget process. <clears throat> yeah, when I read through it, I came away with just two things that I might want to uh, adjust and one is that uh, well you say that uh, affordable housing was is one of the uh, areas uh, where we could direct funding because it's part of I'm trying to remember your terminology here um, for the economic development and community vital community <coughs> vitality mm -hmm. efforts I think it would be helpful to add affordable housing in there specifically. As its own category? No, With just that. economic development, comma, affordable housing, and community vitality efforts. I agree. And then the other thing was at the end, you said that in Stowe, for example, the manager notifies the select board about his intent 
or her intent or their intent, uh, to appoint de a department head. Oh, that was the other part that, that, that's from the other part of the charter that we don't need to have. Okay. In the, this is just the local option tax policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I was just going to suggest that uh, we increase that to 15 days as opposed to seven because uh, it, just to avoid having to have a special session um, so that we would you know, be able to deal with this on a regular, uh, our regular s schedule and not be forced by a <coughs> same day limit. Yeah, to me, if you were to add affordable housing to that part of the policy, it uh, looks great to me. Well, Alyssa. Um, I guess two things. One, just to address your point, right, just I want to get clarification, Tom. You didn't say, I think the language as proposed right now is saying that it <coughs> needs consent from the select board, but doesn't right. specify the manner so we can say internally it's 15 days via email or whatever we want. Right. The charter isn't that specific, I think, because I completely agreed with your point when you said, Roger, of, <laughs> that we don't want it to be seven days, but we can, after the fact, determine what that looks like. Um, on the other, I just want to say in terms of policy, mm -hmm. so I guess one in terms of like why we're discussing it is I think as we're getting closer to public hearings, I also just anticipate it's going to be a question we're going to get and want to have time for us to discuss. Um, and then in terms of policy, are, are we saying essentially at a future meeting we could adopt a policy which is including all of the proposed bullets from as proposed by the manager. Um, I guess one I did want to say is I think mm -hmm. since this, we had the presentation from the auditors and mm -hmm. the whole overall deficit and the undesignated fund balance. And um, I just wrote, what auditor said question mark? Um, but uh, to me, I guess there is a question for us around like, are we, do we want to draft a policy with that 10% as a fixed number and then say the other 90% is to be proposed annually out of this collection of bulleted uses. To be clear, I would be supportive of that. I just want to, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> again, not pigeonhole ourselves. It's this really hard balance between, I think, like we talked about, like with ARPA. I know we did get public comment to be effective, like are folks going to be able to weigh in every year? So right. what's a policy that both, again, gives us big box parameters and then lets us to the extent we want to say, you know, within those big box parameters, this is what we came up with this year. And again, mm -hmm. I think within the, if I'm counting, you know, three black bullets mm -hmm. plus four, if we're including this fund balance piece, mm -hmm. um, we could probably do that. Um, I have a question. Uh, Tom, did you want to answer that first or uh, then we can go um, ahead? Sure. So the fund balance piece. Um, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to take some time um, to to sort itself out. Um, the way I envision is if we if we thought in a budget year seven hundred thousand dollars in local tax uh, local option tax revenues would come in, we basically budget for ten percent of that to just go straight into our fund balance. So it'd be more or less off budget. Um, and I, I think. Um, you know, I think all the numbers I presented have been pretty conservative, so I think we could do that. Um, and then I view, I guess if I want to, maybe this will inform the policy a little bit. Um, if I had to preview the 2025 budget, um, you know, we've lost our local source of gravel and sand, so we've got to go further for it. Um, we're thinking that our next public works vehicles are going to be the big tandem actual dump trucks because they can haul 16 yards and we've only got one of those now. Um, all our other trucks haul half that, if not less. Um, and we, we tend to do that work on, on bad weather days when we can't do other stuff. Um, so there's a couple big pieces of equipment that we might want to budget for and buy in a future year and pay for with cash from the local option tax. Um, I think a lot about recreation facilities. Um, you know, I'm. You know, we're nearing the finish line of getting some answers in the pool, um, and I'm assuming if the community decides that they want a new pool, um, 
I'm assuming it's going to be a three or four million dollar investment. Um, never mind our small tired recreation building. Mm. <laughs> so there's some some big numbers headed down the pike. Um, some are discretionary and some really are not. Um, I'd also I'd also like to in twenty twenty five consider we've got some smaller debt items, things like trucks that we bonded for, and it'd be nice to just kill those with cash, and then going forward our budget's easier because we've got the debt just out of the budget. So I view it as a tool to, in a lot of respects, manage debt, which I think is probably the most effective way to use it. I was going to just add, uh, there's also our. Our constituents are also going to be hit uh, by an increasing uh, uh, education tax, and the uh, district is going to be going for another bond vote. And one of these years, it will probably go through to uh, rebuild a significant part of the high school, uh, which is going to impact the their tax pocketbook as well. Uh, Kane's next. Uh, he like. actually answered my uh, question. Okay. Mike. Um, I know towns love buying equipment. Have you thought about, instead of buying like bigger dump trucks, weighing the cost of trucks, you know, you know, having a contract with, you know, XYZ hauler to truck materials for us? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I was actually, we were just talking about that last week. Um, if we buy a load of gravel right now in Barry, um, that's where we're getting it, right? It's, I believe it's 11 or $12 a ton, um, and it's, you know, it's an hour round trip, piece of heavy equipment. Um, if we get it delivered, it's $25, $26 a ton. Um, the cha so it, the challenge is, you know, it's hard to compare those things. If we get it delivered, we can use that labor and our equipment for other things. Exactly. Um, the challenge to simply hauling all the time is that when there's bad weather and we can't do road work, we can frequently free one or two people up to go get gravel. Right. So if we're going to do that, it doesn't make sense to get it five yards at a time. So we're going to look into can we get a can we get a tandem with a trailer and get twenty yards something like that. Um, right. Because municipalities just love buying, you know, equipment, and sometimes, you know, large corporations wind up leasing things, you know, leasing services. I, you know, if you've done the math, I kind of want to probably trust what, what, what you're doing, but I have to look at the cost of bonding for a 16-yard dump truck is yep. not cheap. Not cheap. Yeah, we'll talk about that more in the 2024 budget. Yeah, when we get the budget. And if, we did, and if there's an intent to buy a truck, we're not going to get it in 2024 anyway. Mm. Exactly. So, yeah, it's a long-term challenge. Part of my hope is if we had this tax, is that in future budgets we could ask the voters to approve buying things like trucks paid for with the local option tax. Exactly. That's, I think, where the attractive thing is getting some outside sources to pay for some of these expenditures that, that, that we do have. Because, you know, you know, back in the old days when, you know, we did the town, you know, town budget and everything's really discussed infinitum, you know, those are the biggest items about, you know, should we buy a grader? Should we, you know, buy a dozer and stuff like that? You know, Everyone has an opinion on those things. Yeah. <coughs> uh, okay. Um, so we're tasked with right now just figuring out a policy <coughs> so that we can sell the the charter in the state house, and then after it's passed, by the grace of God, <laughs> uh, a future select board can just change the policy. Correct. So this could really say anything as long as we can get it through the house. Uh, if it's in the charter, it cannot be changed. Not the charter, the policy. Yeah. <clears throat> Alyssa. I guess I was going to say aspirationally, I hope we envision a policy that will serve the community yes. well for many years and will help us to explain our intent and rationale behind the charter to voters. So I guess like 
in terms of next steps. I think in the spirit of the charter, though we're not hoping this is in the charter language that we're gonna sign next, I wonder if we have, akin to the charter, a nice one-liner of, this policy governs spending for, uh, you know, Waterbury's local option tax. Proceeds are to benefit one sentence that includes these four bullet points, and then we could give examples of proposed spending and then you know give this as informational but really go for a again in the spirit of the charter like two sentence policy of saying that it's reductions or stability to tax rate funding for economic development affordable housing and vitality and efforts to streamline municipal operations as well as remove deficits period and then mm -hmm. again create that big box um and then you know perhaps we have a second page to say, here are some examples of what this would mean in practice. That'd be my proposal. I agree. Um, do you want me to make that as a motion? Do we want to come back? Our delightful <coughs> manager will not be here next meeting. Again, we don't yeah. have a time pressure to adopt it, but I felt like we, we want to. Why not? To it's right in front of us. We've just discussed it. So. I can draft it before next meeting and you know, mm -hmm. tomorrow, Wednesday, circulate it mm -hmm. and give everyone plenty of time. So even if I'm not here, hopefully you'll have something that's. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Great. I'll just warn you if I circulate it, which is which I can do, is fine. Um, just respond to me individually with comments. Otherwise, it's public. Otherwise, we're in violation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, sign warning of special town meeting. <laughs> This has already been approved, but we need the official <laughs> signed version uh, to be entirely legal. Is that correct? Getting our signatures all warmed up today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Official this. Mm -hmm. Okay. As that is going around, we can launch into next meeting agenda. Lots of this from last meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Finding my house. I can go. Do you want to go? <laughs> you know, pull it up again. I think we did move something, didn't we, Nashville, Friday? Um, yeah, something moved. Restorative right. justice. I reached out to Carol Flint, who's with the Restorative Justice Center. She's not available until November. Until November. Great. Wow. Okay. That's all there. Yeah. As I m mentioned, um, I did run into this uh, Cindy setting. Uh, apparently, they had a fairly active uh, committee that would uh, set up these circles, restorative justice circles, uh, and bring both the victim and the alleged perpetrator in, uh, along with other community members, and uh, work through a process of identifying what what went wrong, what can be done about it, uh, and uh, how to reintegrate uh, both parties in, into the community again in a healthy way. Um, and she has since joined the school board, and so she said that she's no longer involved, but she thinks that there's still a committee, at least nominally, in place. Uh, and she agreed that Generally, there's not a lot of activity here. It's more focused in the uh, bad towns of uh, Montpelier and Barrie, um, but that uh, terrible towns. We don't need to. I would say we don't need to bring other towns into this respectfully. <laughs> no, she, no, had, she had a whole session at the town <coughs> fair on that exact issue. On what? On restorative justice. She did a. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, at the town fair. Oh, okay. You. But it was in the public safety track, which I didn't attend a lot of. Uh, okay. Cool. Yeah, decide where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, the reason I'm interested in it is that I do think uh, I, I would like to acquaint, if they're not already, and, and it sounded like that uh, Officer uh, Chuck quite uh, Wynn uh, was not. Um, really familiar with it and it just seems like if this is an avenue that's available to them uh, particularly for youthful offenders um, they should be aware of it and understand how it works 
and we, I don't know what sort of support they need. Okay, um, back to the agenda for the 16th. Um, we have uh, the consent agenda and the nominations for the Disaster Preparedness Committee. Um, now, is this when we're going to announce the nominations, or is this is going to be uh, the, uh, assessing the candidates? Assessing the candidates. Okay. Has that been advertised? No, because I didn't have an application and I don't have a mission statement. That's right. I've been busy. I will get that to you by tomorrow. Is that going to give us enough time to have nominations? Right, that's our question. Yeah. We can move that to the session after if we need to. Mm -hmm. The 30th is your informational meeting. Gotcha. It doesn't mean you can't do it. Let's give it a shot. If we're short, we're short. I okay. Think, let's give it a, All right. Let's, let's, give it let's a move quickly. And even if it's conservation and housing, I mean, right. we, and we, we can found always those to be time fill intensive processes. open slots as needed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, the you'll be getting that mm -hmm. information to yeah. you, and then we can advertise for these positions, and then we'll be look, interviewing uh, nominees in two weeks. Yeah, so what I'll, I'll do it from Porch Forum post, like I've done in the past, but I'll include a link to your newly I'll get you updated tomorrow. Yeah, and um, start accepting. I think two weeks is fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think people are going to see it and they're going to do it right away or they're probably not going to do it at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Interested they, or they're not. Yeah. yeah. How about the roundabout? I just, uh -huh. Yeah, of course, Lisa. Yeah, I'll include and your new course. Facebook page. And, um, <laughs> yeah. We'll see how we do. I think that's a great use of that time because Tom will be here and, mm -hmm. you know, we'll do it early. So, you know, people aren't left sitting here waiting and, yeah. Okay. And then uh, there's another issue on which Tom is agnostic, uh, which is the town meeting changes. I might suggest we name the agenda item town meeting format and plan mm -hmm. for 2024 and beyond. Mm -hmm. Just speaking for myself, I think that might be misleading <coughs> and or cause quite a lot just to say we're having a discussion about what format we'd like mm -hmm. to use, if yeah. we'd like to use that format or have conversation about a different one. I'm getting to my own personal views just, on this. It's just but. A draft. Oh, oh, no, I know. I just don't want anyone thinking we're immediately no, starting with the select board is going Especially to for a 10 minute session. Yeah, uh, yeah and we could have like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Grinch is going to kill town meeting. I would say, yeah, that was, that wasn't good, Karen. I just didn't want to cause undue uh, stress and anxiety. <laughs> so what is the goal for that sesh? Um, it's been discussed. Uh, as to whether we should have town meeting on Tuesday, uh, which uh, is normally the day, uh, and uh, whether it should be at 9 o'clock in the morning, during which most working people, uh, or many working people, are working and do not have the option to take the day off unless they take personal time. Uh, and towns that have moved it to a Saturday or a Monday night or a Tuesday night uh, have found that they get more um, participation. participation, yes. And so it's a question about how, what do we value within democracy and uh, what would make most sense. So is that is a goal for us to present sort of our opinions and then hear feedback from people who are here? And if so, then decide next steps? Or are we hoping to get more, or are we hoping to get additional public input between now and then or not until after we have that initial conversation? Yeah, I don't think we have the time right now to, yeah. we're not prepared for one, uh, and two, uh, we don't really have the time to discuss and come up with our con considered opinion. So I think it's more uh, the latter, uh, just opening this up for opinions uh, and seeing what people have to say. Um, we can each state our point of view. Uh, Mike? I don't know if we're going to have uniformity on 
among the whole select board as to which way we want to go. I can have that and you probably don't. We won't. <laughs> <laughs> we won't. And just a reminder, if there's ever any desire by the select board to change the format of town meeting day, it requires approval by the voters on town meeting day. Right. Super right. inclusive democracy. Yeah, uh, listen. To that end, I'm on wordsmithing round three and wondering about initial discussion of 2024 it. town meeting I format. Yeah. yeah. Just in the sharing with the public Shall what we agree? intend that conversation to be. And then maybe let's stretch her out to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. We yeah. call it open, just wrote open initial discussion. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's all I'm writing. Settle on what you will. Um, I agree with Melissa's change. I think that's a good one. I think too many people, if they hear cow meeting, all of a sudden, yeah. oh, we're going to Australian ballot. Oh, we're going to this. And to be clear, I think if folks have strong feeling, I think we would love to hear that. And with right. Danny around managing, I just don't know that we're. <coughs> I personally have no intent of trying to do that outreach in the next two weeks <laughs> and being right. informative and recognizing we do have this charter conversation happening at the same time. You know, again, we have an agenda item so I can share my old views, time. but again, my leaning has to do with some of those things. Um, I am wondering, and I is don't. There, is there a hand raised? No, no, no that's Karen's okay. cursor. Um, Every time. In regard to that, only Tom, because you've joked about it, and please feel free to say no, I'm not asking this, but you've mentioned your proposed budget timeline mm -hmm. in your dream. Um, and while I'm not wanting to hold you to it, I don't know if any of that would be useful for that conversation, just in terms of if you have broad strokes. So that's not a so. formal request. I'm just saying if hypothetically you had said, I, it, as a manager, am planning to present a budget on this time frame. Money. I'm thinking that information might be useful for that. Which you don't have so, to tell us right now. <laughs> I can, but the history before me is that the serious budget conversations didn't happen until the new year, um, for the most part. Um, yeah, sometimes and, we've started in November <coughs> if we felt that it was necessary. And I don't, I don't think we need to wait that long because waiting for a couple months of spending to close out this year isn't going to inform 2024 that much. Mm -hmm. So my goal is to give you a draft budget um, that I've gone through with department heads here um, down to the tax levy and tax levy and tax rate um, by Christmas. So when we're discussing the budget um, in January, we're understanding, hey, here's where we're at. You know, if the tax rate increases X percent and that's too high, then we can review budgets in that context. But my goal is to not present department by department first, but to give you the overall view. Okay. Just looking for uh, Christmas. <laughs> or, uh, I said it? we wouldn't yeah. hold him to it, Roger. The pulling well, off the phone is no, not helping. It, it <laughs> seems like our first meeting is going to be the fourth, and then the next will be the eighteenth, and then we won't meet until January. If it's a tougher budget. I'll probably wait until after Christmas to email it to you. <laughs> right. If it's bad nice, news, nice. please do wait. Um. But essentially, it'll uh, it, it'll be a question of arriving at that m first meeting in January, informed or less than informed, right? Anyway, I just think like, <coughs> jumping. We've yeah. got thirty minutes in the future, so thank you. All right. Anything else you want to put on the agenda? Anything you want to pull up from the parking lot? Um, I'll have one item for you. Oh, that I, I don't have any detail on yet, but I don't believe it's complex. Um, got a bevy of animal control related calls today. Mm. We don't have an animal control officer. Um, we know. Has, uh, her uh, resignation <coughs> was effective? Uh, if, essentially, immediately for new cases, she's going to wrap up a few, mm. a okay. few, a few loose cents. But in reviewing our animal control ordinance, it refers to a schedule of fees 
for civil fines. Mm -hmm. An issue came up today regarding a habitually loose dog mm -hmm. that at some point could potentially be addressed via a fine. Um, we cannot find the schedule of fees. Ooh. So, <laughs> rather than spend hours researching in the, the depths of the vault, maybe it's best to just adopt one. Okay. Ask Bill. I didn't ask Bill. <coughs> oh, I, asked, did? I did not. No, I asked Carl. I did not think to ask Bill. I can ask him. Bill is 34 years. He must. You know what else I didn't do? I didn't check in that three ring binder that we found. I'll look in there tomorrow, too. Any, so. any jumping off point. Whatever it is, <laughs> yeah. whatever it is, it's obsolete. I mean, yeah. it hasn't I was been looked at in years. If it's 30 years old, yeah. uh, then uh, maybe. Uh, As part of that conversation. I would one updated anyway. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. As part of that conversation, thinking about you know um, equity inclusion and and how we view our community, I wonder if we think about a fine being the right way to go. And it may be, but rather than thinking about it as that's the way we've done it, not <coughs> normal, so that's what we're going to do. Um, is that the solution? I think about a habitually loose dog, which I may or may not be this case, the fine can't and won't be paid and won't change the situation and is just going to enhance this or continue to degrade the situation um, for which this continues to happen for that person. Um, and so as, as we move forward with that, it's just something that maybe we think about and, and be a part of that conversation because like, like speeding, for some folks it's impactful, so for some folks it's not, and for some folks it's absolutely detrimental to their um, you know, well-being and finances. So just I want to bring that up since we're starting to have the conversation, and by no means, obviously we need to have it, but just something to think about as we move forward with that discussion and decision. There was a document in Carla's filing cabinet about an animal, I can't recall if it was a dog or a cat, but they were surrendered because they couldn't afford the fees and and they couldn't, it was a dog because they couldn't afford to license it, mm. which is $15. Right. So I well, think it speaks to your point. Maybe it's got up. Yeah. If we have fees of any sort that are unpaid, can we leave the property? You want a dog? What? You, you want, want a dog? A <laughs> no, but you know, when you lean a property, you know, even if it's an insignificant amount, you may get paid by like a lien holder who's looking to go in there and wants to get rid of that that lien. So they may include that in there, like if someone gets a loan. So well, towns do that, and I'm thinking of for fees that are more than you know twenty five dollar fees. Right. So not so much and not so much relevant to this situation, right? Is that um, what you mean? Yeah, I, I'm just saying if if you have any unpaid fees. Sure, so I'm a renter that can barely afford my rent and groceries, and I cannot pay those fines. Well, that's not going to, you can't be lean. So that's what we're talking right. about. We're talking about folks in a really specific situation right. who can't, you know. I'm thinking of a homeowner. Yeah, so different, mm -hmm. probably, yeah. No. And, the uh, answer, and the answer to leaning a property is, I, I don't believe we can. Okay. I don't believe the legislature is authorized to lean property for, for fines and fees. Uh -huh. Just okay. for taxes and utilities. Just for taxes. To be clear, it's not my dog. That was a hypothetical okay. story. Okay, outside of the leaning the property conversation, to go back to uh, Danny's point, I'm sort of going to piggyback on your point and sort of not. Um, I also think it is not fair to punish, to penalize people <clears throat> via their finances. I think it's dirty, especially for working class people. However, even if we were to do something like that, we don't have enforcement to enforce anything. We don't have enforcement for the noise. We don't have loitering enforcement. We don't have the cameras that are still in our parking lot. So even if we were to hand out these fees, these fees would go unpaid. And what do you do? You can't lean the house. You can take them to court. Get a judge. Small claims. What, what is the... Okay. At the end of the day, what, you know, like if we're finding someone 30 bucks because their dog got out or 50 or whatever, and then we have to take them to small claims court, it's not worth it for us to do that. Um, 
Lisa, you had uh, something to say? I don't want to interrupt the count if you want to have a conversation. Are you finished with? Oh, uh, all, I was well, I think uh, Alyssa was going to respond to My it point too. was this seems ripe for a future agenda item. That was my only right. comment. Yeah, this is actually Clearly not there's lots we can agenda. get into for our next meeting. Yeah. I just want to correct these bad behaviors. That's what I, I think we're all on the same page just wanting to correct it. But how we do that is right. a That's little a bit of an issue. Chat. Yeah. Uh, now, Alyssa. January 10th, 2011, Waterbury Select Board minutes. Um, 2011. 2011. Mm -hmm. Rebecca Ellis was chair. None of us were here. This is right before I, well, I was a senior in high school. Yeah. Jack <laughs> Rebecca well, Ellis. I was uh -huh. Remember all this. Um, the animal control ordinance fee was schedule was reviewed. Bob Butler made a motion to approve the ACO fee schedule wow. dated January 10, 2011. The motion was seconded by Karen Miller and approved by this president. So if there's nothing attached to these minutes, no so attachments. Oh, yeah. Just pre Karen. Mm, but She's we know where to look. Not, well, that, might be that doesn't tell me where to look. I, I don't It gives me another nope. place to try, but, yeah. I, you know, I appreciate oh, it. Least. I looked online. I looked on the back <laughs> end of our website today to see if it was it's hidden in, in there and not live. Um, so I can look at the <coughs> minutes um, book 2011. You just January said? 10th. 2011. January 10th, 2011. So it might have, I don't know what they did for packets or anything ahead of that, but there was a schedule that they had um, discussed in and then there's this other little three ring binder that we found with little gems in. So yeah, <laughs> that's another special for each mm -hmm. Well, and we got uh, Bob Butler's <laughs> memory. And, uh, that's rock solid. <laughs> exactly. Hardwired. <laughs> and I can even ask uh, uh, Becca. She remembers. But in any case, we're going to have to update it, or I expect we're going to have to update it, but we'll, ha we'll have it on the agenda. And on the 16th. Uh, yeah, Melissa. Um, I want to see if Tom wants to be here for this, but Mike, and follow up to your conversation, I know the Vermont League of Cities and Towns is running another EPIC cohort, which is Ethical Performance Improvement Program. Epic, epic, it is. I'm like, I knew it was ethical performance improvement curriculum or something like that. Um, anyway, it's a social justice, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion type training. Um, it's a program where municipalities apply. I believe eight or nine went through the first cohort. Um, I don't have the deadline ahead of me, but my question is, I believe it does require the manager to be there, so we might want to wait till Tom can be there, but if it's due in early November, I don't know if it's worth us having an initial conversation at that meeting about if we're interested in applying. Why not? Okay. Epic. Epic. I'll see if I can get you a Yeah, you, would you be interested in presenting? Uh, I can try, or I can ask if someone else can, because mm -hmm. I don't know that I'm, I mean, I am on the VLCT Equity Committee, and we are aware that this is being run, and I have materials on it, but I go. don't know that I'm the most appropriate. Well, okay. Anything more on uh, the training, uh, emergency <coughs> management training? Not yet. Okay. Our EMD has been on vacation. Uh -huh. A little bit. Applied by November 9th, so we can, in theory, wait till the 6th. All right. Well, we can. Oh, yeah, well, initial conversation. Yeah. Initial conversation, yeah. They're all initial conversations. <laughs> 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 so there were initial discussions. <laughs> well, no, no. Got, so We're not fighting, we're conference. just having a discussion. Okay, uh, anything more on this? I think we may be in the. Uh, Ready to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Before we are adjourned. Nine and early. <coughs>